Hi, Tom Trento, Director of the United West, with part two of our Israel Security Summit. In part one, you heard Lieutenant Colonel Alan West, General Jerry Boinkin, General Tom McInerney, and Gary Bernson look deeply into some of the systemic and categorical reasons why the United States should maintain a solid, unshakable relationship, national security relationship with Israel. You heard about the Islamic State and its threat, not just to Israel, not just to the West, but to the United States. You heard about some of the problems that the hard left in the United States is causing for the nation of Israel. You listened to the anti-Semitism and Jew hatred be addressed by our national security issues. In part two, you will hear questions from the audience, questions that you yourself may even ask. All of this is not simply to provide information so you become more aware, more educated on these critical issues. But our goal, and our goal for the Israel Security Summit, was to mobilize activists to fight against the hard left, to fight against the Obama administration, which is abandoning Israel day by day, and to develop a body of people in the United States to stand firmly with Israel for national security reasons. Watch part two and get ready, folks. We have a lot of work to do. The question is, can you have a viable ceasefire with an Islamic terrorist organization whose reason for existence is your extinction? Start with you, General McInerney. No. And, and I, I just, whenever you see this action by this administration and this president, let's face it, it is this president that made those decisions, then you've got to understand he is not supporting Israel. It's very simple. It's very clear. And that's why it's such a dangerous situation for us. Hamas will never, ever make peace with Israel. Hezbollah will. None of them will. And so that's the danger. If you think they will, you live in a different world. Uh, you, you, I'll be harsh. You'd get in line for a shower if you think that. That is very harsh language. But they want to destroy Israel. They'll do anything. They'll sacrifice their population. They don't care how many school kids. Anything they can do to destroy Israel is what their objective is. So any administration that even thinks that you can deal with them doesn't understand the problem. Stacey Chief. Hezbollah and Hamas both have in their charters the destruction of the state of Israel. Every document, every speech, every public pronouncement, uh, and, and they call it a resistance. It's not about resistance, it's about, it's about destroying the state of Israel and reoccupying that territory. It's, it's clear and it's complete. Jim Boykin. Let me throw something in here. I think these two have answered the question very well. It, it is very important for Americans to understand that uh, in 2008 there was a trial in Dallas, Texas called the Holy Land Foundation Trial. What that trial was all about was raising money in America to support Hamas. They convicted the five descendants, defendants on 108 counts of raising money in America to support Hamas. And by the way, CARE, ISNA, ITT, Islamic Trust, all of these front groups for the Muslim Brotherhood were identified as unindicted co-conspirators. Think about it. We're part of the problem. Here in America, we're supporting Hamas. And this administration and the previous administration will not stand up and look these groups in the eye and say, you are part of the Muslim Brotherhood. In fact, Eric Holder has said, we're not going to take them to trial even though they were unindicted co-conspirators. We're part of the problem. You want to make a 
a difference for Israel? Get some people that have some cojones in our Congress and in the White House that will stand up to it. The, the, the general and I are old paratroopers, and I guess we do think on the same lines because it's a great segue to the next question. The question about domestic jihadism. International manhunt for an American man, and this question, is he the mastermind behind so many of those ISIS videos, the terror? He was raised right here in America, and ABC's chief investigative correspondent, Brian Ross, tonight. For a group that seeks a return to the 7th century, ISIS has become a master of 21st century internet propaganda. And tonight the hunt is on for an American who may have helped to create some of the graphic videos of battles, executions, even child recruits seen in new images today. All rolled out on Twitter, Facebook and other sites like some slick American media campaign. ISIS understands very well that in order for an act of terrorism to be effective, it needs to actually terrorize people. Which is why law enforcement officials now tell ABC News they are focusing on this former college student from Boston, Ahmad Abu Samra, believed to be one of the architects of the ISIS social media strategy. Abu Samra was put on the FBI's most wanted terror list late last year with this description posted online. Abu Samra is 5'11", with a thin build, and he has a higher-pitched voice. Listen now to a recording of his voice. If they don't have a warrant, they don't have the right to do that. Abu Samra grew up in Boston, the son of a prominent doctor. An honor student at a Catholic high school, Abu Samra went on to Northeastern University, where he studied computer technology, the very skills authorities say he is using now. The internet campaign authorities say Abu Samra helped engineer with its horrifying images has been vital to the ability of ISIS to capture the world's attention and win new recruits from the U.S. and elsewhere. It has actually energized their base. They feel that they are now finally in a confrontation with the United States of America. And that is exactly what the FBI says Abu Samra says he wanted to do when he fled this country became a fugitive in Syria. Fight and kill his fellow Americans, David. Hi, Tom Trento here with the United West crew here in Mosul, Iraq, hunting down terrorist Ahmed Abu Samra. Uh, Abu Samra is a 33-year-old Syrian who is the head of ISIS social media. He's putting out those sophisticated videos and the beheadings. We are going to go over the border into Syria, try to find him, and, um, well, if you haven't figured it out by now, we are not in Iraq, nor are we in Syria, but we have hunted down Ahmed Abu Samra. Because you see, um, about 10 or 12 years ago, Mr. Uh, Abu Samra graduated from Stoughton High School, the school right behind me. Stoughton High School is in the bedroom community of Boston known as Stoughton, Massachusetts, about 26,000 people. And indeed, Ahmed Abu Samra, who is indeed the head of ISIS social media purported by the FBI to be that terrorist on their top 10 list. He graduated from this school. What is the point? Very simple, folks. The jihad not only has come to America, but this ISIS movement has touched even the bedroom communities of the United States of America. And we here at the United West will bring you this developing story and equip you to fight this jihad, ISIS, and any other Islamic terrorist group that comes along. We need to work together, save America, save the West, and we're going to bring all this information to you. You know, if you go out of this synagogue, and I learned this today, and you take a right, and you go down to the red light, and you take a left, you're at Stoughton High School. And I think that's about 400 meters. And we just found out last week that someone who attended and graduated from Stoughton High School is now the social media guru director for ISIS. Went to Northeastern University. We recently found out that two Americans from Minneapolis, Minnesota have been found on the battlefield killed in Syria fighting for ISIS. The question I have for the panel, very simply, what do we need to do better to combat against the domestic jihadism problem? And as well, you brought this up, General Boykin, what do we need to do better?
to fight against the cultural jihadist apologists that are out there. We'll start with the station chief, Bernson. Uh, I'd like to say that, first off, we have terrible problems with immigration in the United States. And this is, I'm gonna give you an example. I'm gonna give you an example of a case. In 1983, the U.S. Embassy was bombed in Kuwait. The Dawa 17 were the group. They went to prison. There was a spiritual leader that led those men, convinced them to do the attack. He wasn't arrested. He fled the country and went to Thailand. In Thailand, he was fermenting trouble. While he was down and praying, someone went up behind him and shot him in the back of the neck with a 22 bullet lodged in his, in his, his spine. He survived the shooting and was transported to the United States for medical treatment. In the United States, he would receive wonderful care and would ultimately become a US citizen. Years later, I get involved in an operation. I wind up out in that part of the country. We're tracking this guy down. And we find that he is now the member of a club with the former president of the United States, George Herbert Walker Bush. And they sit across from each other in, the, in a ballroom there. You know, but the point of the matter is, is that individuals who, are, who are, have been known terrorists, have committed acts of terrorism, have found their way into the United States and our immigration system. The background system has been terrible. They have not checked these people out. And this individual, I then flew out to Kuwait to get the evidence to kick him out. But the problem was Iraq had invaded Kuwait and stole all the evidence. So this, you know, but we have problems like this all over the place. And so in addition to just the small cases, like in, that were not small, but but the cases of young men being recruited into jihadism in Minnesota and other places, we've had big cases over the years of some real bad characters that get in here that have come in under medical uh, cases or have come in as religious leaders sponsored by their organizations, and then the terrorists are among us. Yeah. It's a terrible problem that needs to be addressed. You know, I'll follow up on to that, and I'll, I'll pose this to you, Jim Boykin. We just recently learned that Qatar has provided $14.8 million to a think tank in the United States of America, Brookings Institute. We know the connections that Qatar has. What is going wrong down in Washington, D.C., you spent some time down there, that allows a D.C. think tank, some, a, an organization that has policy influence in the United States of America, to be receiving endowments? And furthermore, how about the Middle Eastern Studies programs on many of our college campuses that are funded by the Saudis? Let's start in reverse order. Muslim student associations and these Islamic studies programs are all founded by the, by the Saudis. And, and the first organization that the Muslim Brotherhood created when it came to America was the Muslim Student Association. Very first one. And it was created to influence not only the, what was going on on that campus, but influence the future through those students that would go out with a skewed understanding of what Islam was and what these people were, were up to. My name is Jumana Imad Musa Ahmed al-Bahri, um, and I'm a student here at UCSD. And um, I found some interesting things about the MSA, which is an organization that's very active on campus. Um, if you could clarify the connection between the MSA and jihad terrorist networks, because yeah, you last, last I checked, we had to do our own fundraising, and uh, we never get help from anyone. So if you could clarify the connection between UCSD's MSA, or if you don't have such information, if you could connect other MSAs on UCs, because the connection wasn't too clear in the pamphlet, just if you could clarify. Okay. Will you uh, condemn Hamas here and now? If I support Hamas, well, I look really bad. If you bad. don't condemn Hamas, obviously you support it. Case closed. <laughs> I have had this experience, uh, I give you, I had this experience at UC Santa Barbara where there were 50 members of the Muslim Students Association sitting right in the rows there. And throughout my hour talk, I kept asking them, will you condemn Hezbollah and Hamas? Uh, and none of them would. And then when the question period came, the president of the Muslim Students Association was the first person to ask questions. And I said, you know, before you start, will you condemn Hezbollah? And he said, well, that question is too complicated for a yes-no answer. So I said, okay, I'll put it to you this way. 
I'm a Jew. The head of Hezbollah has said that he hopes that we will gather in Israel so he doesn't have to hunt us down globally. For it or against it? For it. Thank you. Thank you for coming and showing everybody what's, what's here. And you're wearing a, a terrorist n uh, neckerchief. Now, the second thing is, I want you to think about the fact that Colonel West just said Qatar was providing millions and millions of dollars to credible U.S. think tanks. I want you to remember that when we released the five men from Guantanamo that Gary captured and put in Guantanamo, when we released them in exchange for Bo Bergdahl, where did they go? Cutter. And I argued on CNN with a four-star that had been the former commander of CENTCOM that Cutter is not going to prevent these people from getting back in the game. And he argued with me that Cutter's our allies. They're going to, they're going to do this. I was shocked. I was really shocked at what he said because he's a good guy. It's just he was blind on this issue. This is happening. This is not just in Brookings Institute. This is happening all over Washington, all over our government, where they're buying politicians, where they're influencing our education system. How many of you realize that of the three textbook publishers today, two of them are owned by Saudis? <laughs> Textbooks for our public schools, there used to be 12 20 years ago. Now there's only three and two of them are controlled by the Saudis. That's the influence that they have. Wake up, America. And I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to anybody that sees this video. Wake up and get your head out of the sand and quit acting like an ostrich. We've got a problem. If we don't identify the enemy, we are going to continue to go downhill until we will not have the constitutional freedoms that our founding fathers left us. Wake up, America. General McInerney, that, that opens up another point of discussion that I'd like to pose to you. You know, we continually hear people say we got to build coalitions with Arab League nations, you know, the 22 nations over there. We can, you know, we just recently heard the, uh, the warning from King Abdullah of Saudi Arabia says, we don't do something about ISIS, they'll be in Europe in a month, and a month after that they'll be in the uh, United States of America. We know that ISIS is getting funding from some of his cousins in Saudi Arabia. So the question I have, and it also comes from Stephen Prone here uh, from Stoughton, are we winning or losing the Saudis? Well, this administration has lost them, even though the president vowed to King Abdullah. Uh, this administration, as was mentioned earlier, wants Iran to be the hegemon in the Middle East. And so that we have parted there. That doesn't mean that we can't have a coalition. That doesn't mean because he's the protector of the two holy cities and this is where the pronouncements come, the fatwas, etc. that uh, must eventually turn them. We must get in their ideological system and they must fix this. Uh, Saudi Arabia is very important. It's very important to us, but it's also part of the problem. The extremism, the Wahhabism, the radical Islamic preachings come out of there. And so we must hold them accountable. And uh, I'm not an expert, but the Sadari Seven, are, uh, which Gary knows a lot about, and Jerry equally as well, there is tension within the royal family on who's going to be the next ruler and how far they are going to come. And that decision has not been made yet, obviously. But it is a very troublesome one. And that's why the danger of ISIS metastasizing, because look, the Saudis have been supporting uh, General al-Sisi and President al-Sisi of Egypt a great deal. He's the only one killing Muslim Brotherhood over there. I still can't get Sean Hannity to understand why it's so important to support him. 
General al-Sisi knows what a threat radical Islam. He's a devout Muslim, don't misunderstand me. But he knows that this contagion can destroy Islam. As I said, if five nuclear weapons go off in U.S. cities, that's going to change the game. There's not going to be political correctness. People are going to say, where did this evil come from? We'll win, but you're not going to like it. But no civilization has seen three to five million dead or wounded citizens in history in a 30-minute time frame. And there are people that think that way and plan for it. And so Saudi Arabia is important to us, but this administration has gone the other direction on them. The Middle East is a very complicated, convoluted area. They only respect strength. And we are not exhibiting that, and that's the danger. Our weakness is making it more difficult on Israel. We keep coming back to that. That jury is still out, Alan, on, on what it's going to be and what are we going to have an administration, like uh, Gary pointed out in the... Uh, uh, George Herbert Walker Bush did conceive so brilliantly in Desert Storm. They paid for it. So I don't, ha I don't think anybody's got that answer, but I'd be very interested to see what uh, Jerry and Gary would say. Well, real quick, because uh, we're a little after 9 o'clock. I want to get you out of here by 9.30. I know that, you know, you guys, I don't know if the Patriots are playing tonight or whatever. <laughs> I do live in South Florida. We won't talk about the football game this weekend. I'm a Falcons fan. Don't worry. Quick point on the Saudis. In 1971, the United States came off the gold standard, and, and the dollar became a fiat currency. But part of the deal was that Nixon cut a deal, Nixon and Kissinger cut a deal with the Saudis to form what was called the petrodollar. Anyone in the world wanted oil that had to pay for it in U.S. dollars. That helped us cement the dollar. Even though we came off of gold, it helped cement our position as the reserve currency for the world, the continued reserve currency for the world, which gives us all economic benefits. This rift with the Saudis now puts a lot of that at risk because in the, in the world economy now, the Chinese are cutting deals and are, are, and are going directly from renminbi into the other currencies around the world. So we're hanging on to this because we have a financial interest in this. The Saudis are important economic partners of ours. We have problems. We have serious problems over their support for jihadists over the years. This is serious. We need to continue to engage them and other members of the GCC. I will say this on Qatar. The problem in Qatar right now is this. In the last two or three years, you had a handoff of power from the former emir to his son. Prior to that, the foreign minister was HBJ, Hamid bin Jassim Al Thani, the most important man in the Middle East. The Qataris were solving problems, negotiating. They really were, in many ways, supplanting the Saudis as a political force. But when the Emir stepped down, gave power to his 33-year-old son, a new foreign minister came in, and boy, these guys are having problems. They're making serious problems. Understand this. We, the United States, need to continue to engage with the GCC, the Gulf Cooperation Council, states, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Kuwait, Oman, UAE, and Bahrain. Last question I'll have from up here, and then we'll go to the cards from our great audience. We now have a United States Army, ladies and gentlemen, that's at 1940 levels. We have a United States Marine Corps that is at pre World War II levels. We have a United States Navy that is the smallest since 1917. We have a United States Air Force since we created the modern U.S. Air Force that has the smallest and the oldest fleet ever. Do we have, and, and understand, we only talked about the Middle East. We did not talk about Ukraine. We did not talk about Russia. We did not talk about Chinese expansionism in the Pacific. We didn't even talk about here in our own hemisphere what is happening down in Latin America. The question is, do we have the military 
an intelligence apparatus to contend with what I see as a global conflagration that we are on the precipice of right now? That's the final question I have for this panel. And I'll start with Jerry Borkin. Joe Borkin. No. <laughs> Uh, so, sir, I, I, that's what I love about you. <laughs> I think it's obvious to everybody. With what he just told you, can we, can we adequately deal with the threats that America faces today? And here's the problem. It's not just these levels. It's the fact that when the next crisis comes, we can't just generate uh, a capable military overnight. It's the industrial base that builds the tanks and the airplanes and the artillery. We can recruit the soldiers, sailors, airmen, and marines, but we can't crank up that industrial base overnight because we've shut most of them down. Those, those, those production lines for modern aircraft cannot be kick-started overnight. And that's what I'm most concerned about is that when the next crisis comes, the industrial capacities of America will take a long time to get going again. And on top of that, General McInerney, are you also concerned about the pink slipping of those middle level leaders in the United States military, captains and majors, senior non-commissioned officers, as well as the fact that we're losing the armaments? Absolutely. Look, we have never treated our people like this before when they're in a com combat zone and they get a pink slip. slip. It, it is unbelievable. We have made social changes in the military that have not helped the esprit de corps and complicated problems. There has been a very calculated way how to not only disarm us, but get within the fabric in the core of what has made us a great military and a great nation. That is very, very troubling. And the difficulty is, if Ronald Reagan came back today, you couldn't crank it up to 7% of GDP like he did because the president, this administration, has kept us down at 1% to 1.5% growth rates, and we need to be growing at 4 to 7%. It can be done, but it's going to take time. Obamacare will never let us be have a national security strategy again. It is designed to kill our military and our capabilities. There are more efficient ways to do things. We need energy independence. There are a host of things in the track structure that can reinvigorate this economy. The $2.1 trillion that's overseas. Give them a year an amnesty and zero rate and see how that sucking sound this money flowing back in here and creating jobs. Not like this administration did when they threw a trillion dollars on their stimulus and didn't have any impact. We've got to take the deregulate again. So these are the things that it's not simply just cranking up the wick and saying we're going to rearm again. It's going to take an economy that can grow that way. Thank you so much, Gerald. Now, Station Chief Burnson, I also want to bring up a little something that happened in history in your field. You know, during the Jimmy Carter administration under Stansfield Turner, we saw an incredible decimation of our intelligence apparatus. Are we on that same glide path again? The numbers are nowhere near where they need to be, but a bigger problem is just total risk aversion right now. So you can field people and you can tell Congress you're doing your job, but if all your station chiefs and your division command chiefs, and if your apparatus in the clandestine service knows that if they step out of line or they, 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 they recruit someone that may, you know, look, when you're working against terrorist organizations, these aren't choir boys, okay? You're going to have to do business with some, you know, surly people at times. But if they don't want you to have contact with those people, you can't do your job. And, and part of the problem is, is that there is huge risk aversion in the agency and that the structure's there, there are people there, but they're not doing the types of collection that they need to do. You got it. I want to go to some of the questions here, and I want to start off with Alex from Sharon. Did I say that right? I say it was Southern accent. Okay. No. But uh, this is a question for the entire panel. To this panel and to the audience, the threat being discussed is clear. 
But we have a new generation of young people maturing into adulthood who seem to not even care. None of this is relevant to this new generation. How can we maintain the national attention on our current threat in the context of national apathy? Whoever wants to step up, better you than me. I think Tom wanted to answer that. I think Tom wanted to answer that. Go ahead, Station well, Chief. Oh, okay, General McInerney. All right. The fact is, it's true. Now, where we have failed our children, is it the affluence, or for whatever reason, we have failed them. Two years ago, when you had the Sarnoff brothers here, they started to realize it. But this threat has been away. And as it comes closer and closer, I think they will maybe get it. But it is something that we have to talk in forums like this tonight and ability to discuss this so they understand it. They have been very, very fortunate to have an affluence. Many are coming out now without being able to get jobs. But I'll say this, those people in the military today God, where does a nation get these kind of people? I mean, you. every time I go out there and see them, <laughs> a, a, a nation that is blessed to have those kind of people will survive. But we do have a problem. I have hope uh, on the next generation only because about three years ago, in between my son's two tours to Afghanistan, I went down and had lunch with him and seven other young men that were all first lieutenants and getting ready to be captains. And I thought these were the greatest young men I had met in my life. All of them had combat tours. All of them had been injured in one way or another. All of them were going back into it without reservation. And I thought to myself, God bless them. You know, I thought, I just really, I, I was amazed. One of the things that we need to do is we need to reseize the initiative in universities, in, in high schools, in colleges. It's curriculum. It's the culture. The other side has, has changed the playing field. They've moved the goalposts. They've changed the curriculum in our schools. They've, they've changed the, the thought processes that our children are being exposed to. America is the greatest country in the world. We don't have anything to be ashamed of. It's not been perfect, but that this is the country that, that freed the world from communism or, or fascism. Uh, you know, defeated communism. We've done more for, for this planet than any other group of people. But you know, when you read the textbooks that have been written uh, by people like, was it Mr. Zinn, uh, you know, that uh, Dinesh D'Souza uh, talks about in his film, you're just horrified. But that's the path they've taken. We've got to go ahead and fight on a lot of other, uh, other areas outside of just national security. If I read this right, this is Tori Salk of Newton, Massachusetts, and this is for CIA Station Chief Bernson. Can you back up the statement that the administration's goal is to break our relations with Saudi Arabia and try to replace it with Iran? Have you seen such a mission statement, been a part of such discussions at some level, or is this a conclusion that you have drawn from your own observations? I have had multiple discussions with people in Washington, D.C., from both sides of the political spectrum. I, 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 have, I know lots of people in government right now that are involved in this process. The reality is, is we, this administration decided to look toward Iran. And it's they wanted a relationship there. It's, um, I'm not going to go ahead and name people in the administration. I'm not going to name the sources. But I've spoken with people that have been involved in this process whether they be in the State Department, the Department of Defense, the intelligence community. This is what I've gotten from multiple people. And with, with, with the, in those discussions and with what I've seen, it's just, it, it, it's, what, it's what's happening. And um, you will see uh, by the end of this administration, you're going to see with it, look, they just moved the bar. We were supposed to have this summer, they were supposed to have the agreement done, P5 plus one. But what did they do? They extended it. The yeah. president extended it again, you know. The point of the matter is, is they're doing everything possible to cut this deal, regardless of what it looks like. No matter how much this thing stinks, there's going to be a deal. There's going to be a deal, and, um, and the losers are us, the American people and the state of Israel. Next question for General Boykin. Um, two to three million 
evangel evangelical Christians did not vote in 2012. And Bob Kearney of Norwood asked this question. Why is there not more outrage uh, against our Catholic Christian brothers who are being slaughtered like the Jews were? Uh, boy, you got to help me out, man. I got bifocals and I'm struggling. Um, the, the Jewish, yeah, you get the gist. Yeah, he, yes. Well, first of all, I, sir, I don't know where you got your statistics, but uh, you said there were three million evangelicals that didn't vote. Well, that was me. <coughs> oh. oh, okay. Well, you're, you're way off. <laughs> the, there, there may have been as many as 38 million evangelicals. I was that trying to be kind, vote. sir. Yeah. <laughs> that is, for all of my evangelical friends out there, Shame on you if you didn't vote, and you should be doing everything you can to shame every evangelical and every Catholic that did not vote in 2012. And I'm not just talking about for president, I'm talking about for the city council, I'm talking about for the school board, the, the county commissioners, the state legislature. That's the most fundamental right that our founding fathers gave us. And shame on you evangelicals and Catholics that didn't vote. This president stood up in his little five minute speech after the beheading and said, as he was talking about ISIS, he said, and they're killing fellow Muslims and they're targeting Christians. Really? They've been slaughtering Christians by the droves. Look it up on YouTube. It's even there. They've been slaughtered. Has he ever said one word? Did he ever make one comment about uh, Pastor Saeed Abedini? Did he ever make one comment about Miriam Ibrahim? No. And by the way, Miriam Ibrahim will be at the Values Voters Summit in Washington. The 26th and 27th of September. If you have not signed up on the Family Research Council website, get your buns to Washington and listen to this courageous woman who said, kill me, but I will not deny the God that I serve. How many of you Christians out there are willing to do that? How many of you Christians are willing to make that kind of statement? Well, if you're willing to die for your own faith, then why don't you stand up for those Christians all over the Middle East in these Arab Muslim nations that are being slaughtered by the, by the hundreds and thousands. Stand up for these people. Nobody else in the world is going to. And in doing so, you may be surprised at what a blessing it will be to you to stand up and be an advocate for these people and stand for Israel. It's our Christian obligation. Next question for uh, Station Chief Bernson, and we kind of talked about this, maybe we can go a little bit depth. The question is from Chris Minou, Minou of North Reading, and what should the U.S. do in Syria? And, and I want to expa expand a little bit. Can we use the same model that you talked about in Afghanistan for operations in northern Iraq and Syria? We can use a hybrid version of that. Um, as, as I stated earlier, and, and as uh, both of the generals have stated, we are going to need people on the ground with forces. Uh, and those foreign forces that we work with don't have the ability to do CAS, close air support. So you'll need special operators that are going to be able to use SOFLAM, Special Operation Forces laser acquisition mechanisms to light up the targets, to bring the air in, to coordinate all of that. Um, we'll be able to do it more easily on the Iraq side of the border. Greater complications in Syria. The, the mention of the air defense system, they, you know, the, uh, the Syrians have the S-300, which is a Russian air defense system, which is a very lethal system, and they're going to have to either bring that down or we're going to have to destroy it, you know. I think, uh, you know, we should ask them, and if they don't, we should destroy their systems uh, so that our planes can operate in there. But, but there was some, uh, another point was made earlier in the, uh, in the evening, and I don't remember if it was here or downstairs when we were talking, that regardless if we defeat ISIS right now and, and, and then have to defeat the Nusra Front after that, there are 20 other extremist groups operating in that space between 
um, uh, between Syria and Iraq. And it's a space three times the size of Lebanon. And, and, and we're going to need a system in Iraq. We cannot separate the fighting that needs to be done in Iraq and Syria from fixing the mess that was made in Iraq when we left. They're probably going to need a federal system whereby in the Sunni areas they have some sort of federalism where the Sunnis can feel safe ultimately governing themselves because you can't trust the, the Shia majority to treat them fairly because they have not. So there's a military component and there's a civil military component to this, which makes it more complicated than anything we've done recently, which makes me worry that this administration, this group of guys, will be able to carry this off. It's, it's, it's a heavier lift than I think they can do. Two final questions, and Joe Boykin, I mean, Joe McInerney will shoot this one to you. Is there any possibility, and this comes from Gregory Kadenoff of Newton, Massachusetts, is there any possibility that Israel will have enough support to finish the job with Hamas? No. Unfortunately, no, Gregory. Uh, not at least in this administration. And then you have to have an administration that says and acknowledges publicly that Hamas is a terrorist organization and we are going to help Israel destroy it. And you take the funding away, anything that's going in there, as well as in uh, uh, the, the PA, Palestinian Authority. Take the money away from them. General Boykin, last question from, from the audience. Why aren't the top brass of our armed forces calling the president out on his <laughs> insane policies they need to look out for our men and women in uniform. And Just being recorded. <laughs> um, okay, I'm going to. They are. Uh, okay, they checked their package at the door when they when they went to work in the Pentagon. And if you don't know what that means, talk, talk to somebody around you, they'll tell you what to do. There's no courage. There's just no courage. Look, I've known, I've known these people, and, they, and there was a point at which they were good, solid commanders. And I think Alan will tell you the same thing. They were good, solid soldiers, but when they got there, they got corrupted by power or whatever. I can't say. But I've got to tell you, it's the biggest disappointment to me in, in, in probably in a long, long time, is that the lack of courage, I mean, we saw it the other day with Marty Dempsey, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, who made a very, what I thought was a very intelligent and comprehensive statement about ISIS and what we had to do and the fact we had to go into Syria. He made that statement on, I think, Thursday, and by Sunday he was backtracking. You know what? Harold K. Johnson was chief of staff of the Army. In his memoirs, he said the greatest regret in his life was the day he had his driver take him to the White House. He was going in and tell Lyndon Johnson, either you activate the Garden Reserves or here's my stars on your table, I'm out of here and I'm going to the media and I'm going to tell them why I'm resigning my commission. He got out of his car at the White House, had a change of heart, got back in his car and went back to the White House. He said he lived to regret that decision because he realized it was a lack of moral courage. These men that are running our military today are going to live to regret the compromises that they have made when they know that all they're doing is degrading readiness and not enhancing the morale or the capabilities of our military in any way. They're going to live to regret it. I'm very disappointed. Pray for these people. Pray that God will give them courage. A very appropriate statement since we started out, be strong and of good courage. Closing comments, two minutes, starting from Station Chief Burnson, based upon this question. How does it end? Um, I believe that um, during, sorry. 
I believe at least the, the current crisis that we face, we will limp along through this. I don't think this administration will confront ISIS in a proper fashion. I believe that the immediate threats that we face right now will be pushed off into another administration. Hopefully, we will be, we, our, our economy will hold together. That's the great danger, $18 trillion of debt. Because I can assure you all, if we have an economic, another problem like we had in 07, 08, our enemies will be at us and at Israel immediately. So hoping that will hold together. Uh, you know, we have two years that we're going to have to try to get ourselves through. And then hopefully by then we will have a, a commander in chief that is willing to fight and defend the United States and take those measures that will benefit us as a people and the world. Right Joe McInerney. Well, it's going to be very difficult. Uh, I agree with Gary. Uh, we'll not have a strong response to ISIS, which is going to jeopardize not only the Israelis, but our other good allies in the Middle East. Uh, we have a constitutional crisis developing. And what I mean by that is, is Benghazi. It's going to turn out with the revelation by these three shooters, as I call them, in the book 13 uh, hours. hours, and I recommend you all get it when it comes out the next day or two. But we left men on an ambassador and people on the battlefield. And we had dereliction in duty. We didn't provide the support beforehand that we knew was coming. 9-11, does anybody think that's a particularly significant date? We did, once they didn't prepare, they did, didn't even try. And then they were involved in a cover-up. Now, what has happened in, in uh, what General Boykin is alluding to, uh, our military leadership has forgotten the difference between civilian control and their responsibilities to the Constitution to support and defend against all enemies and foreign and domestic. And that crossover point came, that crossover point came for the former chief that Jerry was talking about. I believe it is there for General Dempsey, the other service chiefs, the combatant commanders. This is a very serious time in our history. And I think we all up here believe that they have got to stand up to their role and responsibilities to the Constitution. Joe All right, I'm I'm a uh, I'm a minister, so I'm I've got to get a little um, a ministerial here. I can't answer that question. I don't know, but I'm going to give you a biblical reference. And whether you're Jew or Christian, go look it up. Go to the book of Obadiah. You Jews can read Obadiah, right? It's in the Old Testament, right? You can still read that. <laughs> go to, go to Obadiah. Obadiah says that the nation of Israel will occupy the valley of the Philistines, the land of Edom, and Mount Esau. That's in Gaza Strip, that's in South Lebanon, and that's on the east bank of the Jordan River. The question that I leave you with to ponder is, is that a prophecy that has already been fulfilled, or is that a prophecy yet to come? If it is a prophecy yet to come, Israel is going to occupy those three areas. That means there's going to be one heck of a conflict and they're going across the Jordan River, they're going into South Lebanon, and they're going to the Gaza Strip and they are going to wipe them out and they will occupy those lands. Ladies and gentlemen, Sitting here before you is almost 90 years of experience in intelligence, foreign policy, national security, service to this great nation. I would hope, I would have thought that these 90 years of experience would be sitting in the White House advising the president before he takes the stage tomorrow night. A round of applause for our fantastic panel.
It, it has been my sincere honor and privilege to moderate here tonight. We have, you know, quite a few three by five cars we could not get to. I will turn these over to Tom Trento with the United West and possibly over the next month or so, they may post answers on their website to these questions. But thank you again for being here. Thanks for having me and I'll turn it back over to the rabbi. My friends, if you could just have a seat for a minute. We, uh, we would be re I would be remiss. I would be remiss if I didn't call upon the co-sponsor uh, co of the evening, the executive director of the United West, Tom Trento. Uh, Mr. West, you just gave me a bunch of cards here to, uh, to go through to answer questions. I think we may have a question here for you this evening. What is your future for this great country? That's only subject to discussion with his rabbi. And it's rab rabbi congregant privilege. Uh, Mr. West is a dear friend and my former congressman, and um, knowing him very well, uh, he will do what God tells him to do. So you pray that God tells him to do the right thing, okay? And then maybe these guys can all be working together. Deal? Deal. Okay, it's a deal. Hey, um... It is indeed a, a very unique evening to bring everyone together. And it's evenings like this that uh, these gentlemen share their experiences. And usually, several people are moved in the audience to become different people, to go above and beyond what they ever believed they could do. And that is indeed the hand of God. I have lived my life putting God first, family second, and our country third. And if we follow the dictates of these gentlemen who have done the same and Lieutenant Colonel Allen West, we're going in the right direction. And one of the greatest warriors that I know in this battle for the free world, and a fellow that we affectionately refer to as the warrior rabbi, is indeed your rabbi here, Rabbi John Hausman. He's a, uh, a man of God indeed. I'd just like to thank everyone and I'll hand it back to the rabbi for, um, for attending the Israel Security Summit. That's the issue. And indeed, as an evangelical Christian, uh, my, my goal and desire is to do, as you said, General, um, to honor Israel, to bless Israel, and to stand with Israel in these extremely, extremely difficult days. And a uh, quick commercial, in March I'm leading a tour to Israel, so if you want to get involved with that, give us a call and uh, we'll take you to Israel to study the war. We're going to be going over there to study the war. Well, there you have it, folks. Over 100 years of high-level national security expertise brought to you in a very detailed, very organized, very understandable presentation. And again, our goal is not just to provide information, but it's to mobilize a group of people to stand with the nation of Israel. And our dear thanks to Rabbi John Hausman for putting this together. And we have heard many times since September when we presented this, that folks want to bring this Israel Security Summit to another venue. That is possible. All of the principals have agreed to go anywhere in the United States to present this material. They understand the importance of Israel as America's national security partner. So if you're interested in getting involved as an activist or in organizing a similar event, contact us at the United West. Info at the United West. We'll be in touch with you. And 
as the Obama administration moves further and further away from supporting our number one national security partner, Israel, it's essential that the good men and women of the United States, like these four individuals who presented the material, stand up, be counted, be heard, be activated, and make a difference. If you want to make a difference, contact us, Tom, at the United West. We're looking forward to working with you. Take care now.